Hi everyone and welcome to my January book haul. So I got way more than I would have thought for the month. There's another haul that I did which is a Durango book haul. I did that separate because otherwise this is so <laughs> way way too long. Um, and so this is just the rest of the books that I got in January of the physical, physical books. So I'll do a separate one for ebooks. Um, but I did what I have termed grief shopping. So um, if you did not watch my Durango book haul, if you did, you'll already know what I'm going to say. But if you did not, um, my grandma, this is my mother's mom passed away on the 9th and so uh, my <laughs> book buying increased as a way to try and give me something happy to look forward to so book hauls in the future will not nearly be as big as this so which is good because <laughs> I really need to read more than I bring in because um, I just don't have the space for it so I wish I had that library from Beauty and the Beast just floor to ceiling, wall to wall, corner to corner. I would just love that. But that's not reality in my life. So let me just tell you what I got. Now, I'll tell you kind of if there's a story, story behind it. For example, I love the Fear Street books by R.L. Stein. And so I keep an eye out on prices. I am not going to pay fifty to forty dollars, forty to fifty dollars, for a mass market paperback of a Fear Street book. So I keep an eye on the prices and wait until they go on sale. So right now there's a book I'm looking at. I think it's like what Holly heard or something. I don't remember the exact title, but right now, like if I go to Amazon, it's fifty bucks. I'm not paying fifty bucks. So I just wait until more people decide they're going to sell their copy and someone puts it for around 10 bucks and then I'll buy it. So I am slowly trying to collect the whole Fear Street series. Now Fear Street, even though it is a series, um, you do not have to read the books in order unless it's like a mini series within this series. For example, there's a cheerleader series. Those like the first evil, second evil, third evil, obviously you read that one in order. But any random Fair Street book, you can pretty much read in whatever order. Um, they don't follow the same characters. They just all take place in this haunted Fair Street type of a thing. So I got two Fair Street books. One is, again, these are by Arl Stein. One is Final Grade. This one says, Intense, competitive Lily Bancroft has good reasons to hate him. She lives to win, and he was about to destroy her dreams. But murder? That was going too far even for someone as driven as Lily. She's innocent, but that hasn't stopped the whispers behind her back or the weird phone calls late at night. Then someone else is brutally murdered and suddenly Lily is drawn into a nightmare she can't begin to control. Will her final grade be her last? So that's Fear Street by Arl Stein. Now this next one is actually, it is a Fear Street, but it's a hardback and I've never seen Fear Street in a hardback before. It's always been paperback, but this is a hardback, and this was actually a library copy. This was a library book in Clinton, Tennessee, so this has been through a lot of hands as far as, like, who's checked it out from from the librarian stuff. Um, the And the reason I know it's from Clinton, Tennessee is it has the thing here, and it's, I mean, it's marked out, but I can still see it's Clinton, Tennessee. Um, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, this particular Fear Street book is called Dead End. I'm trying to get it without the ring light. There you go. So Dead End by Arl Stein. This one says, Natalie Erickson and her friends share a terrible secret. They were all in the car that foggy night, the night someone died at the dead end. Now someone knows too much and there's danger ahead. Natalie wants out of this nightmare, but that's the problem with dead ends. There's no way out. So those are the two Fair Street books that I have got to add to my collection. I'm very happy about that. Okay, now I did an announcement video. I'll link the Discord in below. I am hosting, starting in February for all of 2023, I am hosting an Autism Reads 
read along. So each month we will read a book that has autism representation in it, um, and some of them, some of these books more than likely are written by an autistic author. There's one I know that is not written by an autistic author, um, and that book, for that book, the author took the inspiration from like a cousin or something like that. But I went ahead and got the next two months. I don't remember which one is for March and which one is for April, but it'll be in the Discord, so the Discord will be in the comment section below, so you can check that out to see. Uh, but these are the next two books. So for February, we will be reading Queens of Geek, and then for March and April, it's one of these two books. So uh, one of them right here is Can You See Me? This was written by two authors, Libby Scott and Rebecca Westcott. So that, and this is middle grade, it says, Tally isn't ashamed of being autistic, even if it complicates life sometimes. It's part of who she is. But this is her first year at Kingswood Academy, and her best friend, Layla, is the only one who knows. And while a lot of other people are uncomfortable around Tally, Layla has never been one of them, until now. Something is different about sixth grade, and Tally now feels like she has to act normal. But Tally hides her true self and starts to wonder whether fitting in is really what matters most. So that's one of the books that we will be reading. The other one is called Afrotistic. This is by Kayla Allen Omizia. And I read the synopsis and I just, I just fell in love with the synopsis and so I'm really excited to get to this one. Uh, this is written by a black author, so if you guys want to read more by POC authors, um, this would be a great option, is from what it sounds like. I can't really say for sure until I've actually read it, but <laughs> this is definitely is an option. So the synopsis reads, In her new town, the 15-year-old strives to make Dean's Merit Society, an elite honor society that she sees as her ticket to success. To make the society, she needs leadership experience, but there's one problem. Noah struggles to socialize appropriately. Desperate to make it in the society, she creates her own group consisting of autistic students from her school, dis from her school district and names it the Roaring Pebbles. With the assistance of the Roaring Pebbles, a robot toy invention, her nonverbal brother, and a bit of classical Mozart along the way, Noah clings to her chance to make the society and to one day finally feel enough. So that is Afrotistic by Kayla Allen Omizia. So, and I love the cover. Love the color combination of the purple and the yellow on that. Okay, this next one I won from Goodreads. Most of the books I win from Goodreads are ebooks, but every now and then I might get a physical copy and this is one of them. I entered this one solely because it says raptor, <laughs> and so I was hoping it had something to do with like the velociraptors, but after reading the synopsis it does not. So a little disappointed, but that was my own assumption. <laughs> so let me go ahead and read the synopsis. It still sounds pretty good. It says, Samantha and James Copey are living the good life, a massive horse ranch in Colorado Springs, almost as big as the island of Manhattan a 16th century chateau in Lyon, France, a business global empire that has a worth larger than most countries, an empire so powerful that it can overthrow governments. Now the Copies are embarking on a new venture, the expansion of a railroad, and I could be saying their names wrong, uh, just so you're aware. <laughs> it's C-O-P-P-I. Uh, okay, moving on. It says, and not just any railroad, but a behemoth that encompasses the entire southwest from the Mississippi to the Pacific Ocean. Not bad for a confused couple that met by chance in a country honky-tonk. The Copies' future back in 1968 looked bleak. She was pregnant with someone's child, not James's. He was assigned to an infantry brigade, brigade headed to war in Southeast Asia. It appeared that all the odds were stacked against the young duo back in 1968. But now it is 1981. Sam is pregnant and is expecting their fourth child. What the Copies desire most is an unexciting and routine lifestyle, an existence that will allow the couple to enjoy the fruits of their labor. But you really cannot turn back the wheels of time, can you? With so much wealth, can the couple ever hope to find a peaceful, ordinary life? 
You don't get to their status without overcoming obstacles in the road to riches. A fortune cannot be made without eliminating threats that want to take it all from you. And you don't get to the top without creating enemies along the way. So that is Manning a Raptor by A.A. A. Frida. Okay, these next two I got from book boxes. So I had a bonus at work and I purchased myself or gifted myself a three month subscription to Owl Crate Jr. Um, and I'm not going to be renewing that one, so I will have one month, one more month of that. I did not do an unboxing for this month. I just didn't feel up to doing any filming for it, so I didn't. Anyway, um, I do like the cover. It looks like this, this is the, uh, first in a new series, and I think this is a debut author. I think this is her first book. Um, and that is Heroes of Haven Song Dragon Boys. So here is the cover. Now the synopsis says, The world once known as Haven has been torn apart over centuries of conflict, with, human, with humans taught to fear all things magical, dragons driven to near extinction, and magic under attack. Now its future rests with four children from four different lands. And these are the four children. First one is right here. This is Blue, a stable boy with a strange gift. He believes magic is nothing but bad luck. He has never been chosen for anything until the fates select him to transform into a dragon and fulfill an ancient prophecy. So that's Blue. River, as a trained excuse me, River trained as a dragon grower to harness the magic of nature. She is crushed with disappointment when she's instead bound to Blue as his rider. So that is River. Shenley, determined to learn the truth about his father's disappearance, he finds himself serving a power-hungry chancellor in the heart of the war against magic, and he must choose where his loyalties lie. So that is Shenley right there. And then this is Ren, and it says, Magics are a constant ally to her people. Isolated on Marakai Island, companions that they can see, touch, and hear. But when she loses her magic the very night it is awakened, she must set out for enemy territory to get it back. So that is Heroes of Haven Song, Dragon Boy. The next one from a book box is The Lost Melody by Joanna Davidson Palatino. I got this from Once Upon a Book Club. I absolutely love Once Upon a Book Club. The thing with Once Upon a Book Club that I prefer over something like Owl Crate is the gifts that come with the book are curated to the story of the book that you are getting. So, for example, if the character is cooking, you could get an apron, you could get a whisk, you could get a recipe, you could get... I mean, there's there's stuff in it, so it's curated specifically to certain parts of the story. So I got this one, I think this was the December, but it, it arrived this month, like in the middle of January, um, because it's Christmas season and so things just got delayed with shipping and everything. Um, but this book sounds so freaking good and I'm so excited for this one. Um, I just don't know when I'll get to it. That's the story of my life with all these books, but... This one says, when concert pianist Vivien Mordant's father dies, he leaves to her the care of a patient at her swell asylum. Vivine has no idea the woman existed, and yet her portrait is shockingly familiar. When the asylum claims she was never a patient there, Vivine is compelled to discover what happened to the figure she remembers from childhood dreams. The longer she lingers in the deep shadows and forgotten towers at Hurstwell, the fuzzier the lines between sanity and madness becomes. She hears music no one else does receives strains missives with rose petals between pages and untangles far more than is safe for her to know. But can she uncover the truth about the mysterious woman she seeks? And is there anyone at her swell she can trust with her suspicions? So, yeah, that sounds really good. All right, the next, let me see... Okay, this next one, I have to pull up the first book in the series to give you any sort of a synopsis. So, let me pull that up. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the Alex Stern series. A lot of people are talking about this one, and I am no exception. I am no exception. Uh, so this is Hellbent. This is the second one in this series. I don't know if this is... Well, this is not a duology. It looks like there's a third one, and it's untitled as of right now. So it looks like there could be at least... It'll be at least a trilogy. Uh, anyway, so this one is Hellbent. So I won't give you the synopsis of this one, but I will go ahead and read you the synopsis of Ninth House, just in case you have not read it. Um, so, and it's not very long. So it says, Galaxy, a.k.a. Alex Stern, is the most unlikely member of Yale's freshman class. Raised in the Los Angeles's Los Angeles hinterlands by a hippie by a hippie mom, Alex dropped out of school early and into a world of shady drug dealer boyfriends, dead end jobs, and much much worse. By age twenty, in fact, she is the sole survivor of a horrific unsolved multiple homicide. Some might say she's thrown her life away, but at her hospital bed, Alex is offered a second chance to attend one of the world's most elite universities on a full ride. What's the catch, and why her? Still searching for answers to this herself, Alex arrives at um, in New Haven, taxed by her mysterious benefactors with monitoring the activities of Yale's secret societies. These eight windowless tombs are well known to be haunts for the future rich and powerful, from high-ranking politicos to Wall Street and Hollywood's biggest players but their occult activities are revealed to be more sinister and more extraordinary than any paranoid imagination might conceive. And this does, um, at least the first one, so I'm assuming this one will have as well, um, paranormal elements. And I love the paranormal elements of the first one. So I am really excited for this one. So again, that is Hellbent by Lee Bardugo. Now this next book I got because I remember reading this and absolutely enjoying it. And my mom had a copy, so I borrowed it from her. Uh, from her, But she didn't particularly care for the series, and she unhauled it, and I've been wanting to get back into it. And I want my own copies. And so that is Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children by Ransom Riggs. What I remember loving about this one is, one, it had creepy vibes. But there's also old photos inside that add to the creepiness. And here's some examples from photos on the back. Um, there's just photos throughout this book. Now there is a movie adaptation of this first one and I did enjoy that. I remember that. I am definitely going to want to find um, and re-watch that movie but after I reread this. So this says, a mysterious island, an ab abandoned orphanage, a strange collection of very peculiar photographs. It all waits to be discovered in Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, an unforgettable novel that mixes fiction and photography in a thrilling reading experience. As our story opens, a horrific family tragedy sets 16-year-old Jacob journeying into a remote island off the coast of Wales where he discovers the crumbling ruins of Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar children. As Jacob explores its abandoned bedrooms and hallways, it becomes clear that Miss Peregrine's children were more than just peculiar. They may have been dangerous. They may have been quarantined on a deserted island for good reason. And somehow, impossible though it seems, they may still be alive. So, that is Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar children. Um, by Ransom Riggs and I don't know how many are in this definitely more than three I want to say there's at least five in this but I could be wrong in this series but it doesn't matter I'm looking forward to it and this next one I got because uh, I read the second one and want to get to this one fairly quickly but this is the third volume of the cat massage therapy manga series so this one we're following some cats as they... It's a contemporary world with fantastical elements. These cats are actually able to communicate with humans. And these cats own a massage therapy. And word gets around this one guy's office that goes there. And so the cats go to the office and give massages at work for this guy's workplace. And that's pretty much all it is. And it's very cute. Uh, 
and I love the artwork in this. So Cat Massage Therapy, and this is by Haru Hisagawa. I hope I said that right, but I doubt that. And yeah, I mean, it's just very simple and just really sweet. So I thoroughly enjoy this. So that's, and this is the only, this is the last one in the series that's out. I don't know if there's going to be more. I hope there is, but I hope to get to this one soon. The next one I got, I heard someone talk about, and I don't remember who I heard talk about it. Um, I want to say it was Allison Pages. I'll link Allison's channel in the description box. She has a really good channel, um, and she is uh, has mentioned and talks about being autistic as well. And I, I do, no, it was Allison I heard talk about this. She talked about this and how she described it. I, I was thinking about getting this for a while, and the way that she described it just kind of made me go, okay, yep, I'm getting it. <laughs> so that is Hidden Pictures by Jason Rukulik, Rukulek, however it is that you actually say that. So the synopsis says, fresh out of rehab, Mallory Quinn takes a job in the affluent suburb of Springbrook, New Jersey, as a babysitter for Ted and Caroline Maxwell. She is to look after their five-year-old son, Teddy. Mallory immediately loves this new job. She lives in the Maxwell's pool house, goes on nightly runs, and has the stability she craves. As she sincerely bonds with Teddy, a sweet, shy boy who is never without his sketchbook and pencil. His drawings are the usual fare, trees, rabbits, balloons, but one day he draws something different, a man in a forest dragging a woman's lifeless body. As the days pass, Teddy's artwork becomes more sinister, and the stick figures evolve into more complex, lifelike sketches well beyond the ability of any five-year-old. Mallory begins to suspect these are glimpses of an unsolved murder from long ago, perhaps relayed by a supernatural force lingering in the forest behind the Maxwell's house. With help from a handsome landscaper and an eccentric neighbor, Mallory sets out to decipher the images and save Teddy, while coming to terms with the tragedy in her own past before it's too late. And what pushed me over the edge to buy this that I didn't know is that the child's drawings <laughs> are, are featured in this book. So, yeah, so I think this will be good. All right, these next two books were buried at the bottom of my suitcase when I did the Durango haul. These were not included, but these were my grandma's books. Um, both of these are middle grade. So the first one is going to be Walk to Moons. This is by Sharon Creech. This one says, as Sal enters her grandparents with Phoebe's outrageous story, her own story begins to unfold. The story of a 13-year-old girl whose only wish is to be reunited with her missing mother. And that's like all the synopsis says. So I don't have much to go on off of it. And just by that alone, I really don't know what this book is about. But it was my grandma's and that's that's all I, I need. Uh, this next one, I'm not sure if she had read or not. Uh, but it is called Prairie Lotus. And this is by Linda Sue Park. This one says, Hannah arrives in the town of La Forge carrying hope. Hope that her father can open a shop, that she can become a dressmaker, and most daringly of, daringly of all, <laughs> uh, that she can attend school with her peers. But this is Dakota Territory, Oseti uh, Sakowin homeland, in 1880, and Hannah is half Chinese. She knows from experience that most white people don't want neighbors who aren't white themselves. The people in La Forge have never seen an Asian person before, and most are unwelcoming and unfriendly, despite the fact that they don't even know her. Still, Hannah is determined to make La Forge a good home for her and Papa. She just has to, has to persuade the townsfolk to see beyond her surface. I like books like that. Um, and we know it was, it was tough back then, you know, for people of different races. I mean, it still can be tough at times, but, you know, anyway, I just, I like that. So, anyway, all right, that's that one. And let me grab, I'll go with these four next. So, 
Okay, so I was out running errands with my mom one day and she wanted to go into Barnes & Noble to look for some note cards that she can only find at Barnes & Noble. I went in with her and Barnes & Noble is one of those places I cannot walk out without bringing home at least one or two books. I walked out with four books, <laughs> so yeah, they, I just, I cannot walk out with empty hands from Barnes & Noble. So four books, one was only $10. And that one is The Last Wife. This is by Karen Hamilton. And this one says, Nina and Marie were best friends until Nina was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Before she died, Nina asked Marie to fulfill her final wishes. But her mistake was in thinking Marie was someone she could trust. What Nina didn't know was that Marie always wanted her beautiful life and that Marie has, a, has an agenda of her own. She'll do anything to get what she wants. Marie thinks she can keep her promise to her friend's family on her own terms, but what she doesn't know is that Nina was hiding explosive secrets of her own. Sounds good. So, The Last Wife. Alright, this next one is called Alex and Eliza. This is the first in a series, and this was written by Melissa de la Cruz. And it just says it's the Alex and Eliza trilogy. And so there's an image of all the books on the back. Uh, but I got just the first one because I don't want to buy a whole trilogy if I don't know if I'm going to like it. But I'm taking a chance with getting the first one. So this one says, As battle cries of the American Revolution echo in the distance, the Schuler sisters prepare for one of New York's society grandest events, their family's annual ball. While Angelica and Peggy swoon over the dashing young men who will be in attendance, Eliza is more reserved. She may be heiress to a huge fortune, but that doesn't mean she wouldn't rather be aiding the colonists' cause or the colonialists' colonists' colonial colonists, I think. I have to think on that. Um, so she would rather be aiding the, the colonists' cause than dressing up for suitors at a silly party. Still, Eliza can barely contain her excitement when she hears of the arrival of Alexander Hamilton, the mysterious, rakish young colonel and General George Washington's right-hand man. Alex, who is an orphan, and a bastard one at that, can't believe how lucky he is to be in such esteemed company. Uh, and when Alex and Eliza meet on that fateful night, so begins an epic love story that will forever change the course of American history. So, that sounds pretty good. This next one, I believe, is also part of a series. Uh, looks like it's called... The series is Rebels of the Ton, I'm guessing? Yeah, it says first in his new series right on the cover. And this one is Notorious by Minerva Spencer. Purely cover by. I think it's beautiful. This one says, The Cure for a Willful Wife. Drusilla Clare is full of opinions about why a woman shouldn't marry, but that doesn't stop the rush of desire she feels each time her best friend's brother, notorious rake Gabriel Marlington, crosses her path. So imagine her dismay when she finds herself in the clutches of a scoundrel, only to be rescued by Gabriel himself. And when Gabriel's heartless and heart-pounding proposal comes, it's enough to make Drew's formidable resolve crumble. And, oh, okay, so the it, the cure for a willful wife is a smitten husband. But it's just separated by these two paragraphs. So uh, the second paragraph in the synopsis on the back says, She's, she's sharp-tongued, exasperating, and due to one careless moment, about to become his wife. Still, something about Drusella has Gabrielle intrigued. First, there's delici the delicious flush of her skin every time she delivers a barb. And then, the surprisingly sensual feel of her in his arms. Gabriel even finds himself challenged by her unusual philosophies. And when he discovers a clandestine rival for Drew's affection, his temperature flares even hotter. But the real threat to their happiness is one neither of the newlyweds sees coming. If they're to save their future and their lives, they'll need to trust in each other and their growing love. So, that is Notorious by Minerva Spencer. And the last book that I got at Barnes & Noble, I saw and was immediately intrigued by the cover and the title. 
and that is everyone in my family has killed someone and this was written by Benjamin Stevenson I don't know if this is a standalone or going to be a series but I don't know I, I am just intrigued by the title and the cover reminds me of Clue with the knife and the axe and the rope and the so kind of and the poison it just kind of give me, gives me Clue vibes but we will see if the story does that. It does say Knives Out and Clue meet Agatha Christie in the Thursday Murder Club in this fiendishly clever blend of classic and modern murder mystery. So I'm even more intrigued. The synopsis says Ernie Cunningham, crime fiction aficionado, is a reluctant guest at his family reunion. Family reunions aren't for everyone, of course. But Ern's part of a notorious crime family, and three years ago he witnessed his brother kill a man and immediately turned him into the police. Now Ern's brother is being released from prison, and the family is gathering to welcome him home. As if that weren't bad enough, the reunion is taking place at a remote mountain resort. The day before Ern's brother is set to arrive, a man's body is found frozen on the slopes. While well, most Cunninghams assume the man simply collapsed and died of hypothermia during the night, Ern's stepsister spots a strange detail. The man's airways are clogged with ash. He appears to have died by fire in a pristine snowfield without a single burn mark on him. The longer the body goes unidentified, the more overwhelmed the local policeman becomes. Po yeah, the local policeman becomes and the more Ern realizes it's up to him to find the murderer. Holmes Christy Charleston, he's read them all. He knows what patterns to look for, what rules killers follow, and of course he knows his own family, every member of which, as he's told us from the start, has killed someone. So, uh, yeah, this sounds really good. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that one, which I'm looking forward to all of these. I'm not going to obtain a book that I'm not looking forward to. Uh, let's see, okay, these... Let's do, let's go ahead and do this one. Uh, so this one I got, my mom mentioned someone that she knows, and I can't remember if it's one of her friends or the child of one of her friends, um, mentioned that they read this book and uh, wish they had read it sooner so that they could try to make the life of their cat uh even better than it already was, uh, just that it is really benefit, really beneficial for any cat owner to read. So I thought, why not? If I can make my cat's life that much better, why not? So that book that they were talking about is Decoding Your Cat. This was written by the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. So it talks about cat bait behavior science and things like that. This is the part that made me determine to go ahead and get this. And it says, cat owners will learn how to prepare for their new kittens or cats, provide a happy, safe, and functional home, recognize and understand behavioral changes. changes. What the heck was I going to say there? Uh, prevent, manage, or resolve unwanted behaviors like urinating outside the litter box, aggression, and more. Identify and seek treatment for medical health problems. That's what I am really interested in. And then help their cat live longer and fuller lives. And of course that one too. So I don't have any behavioral problems with my cat Ophelia. But in the future you never know. when it's when I, If I ever get another cat. Could be nice to come in handy for the behavioral issues. But yeah, so that'll be good. So I'll get to that at some point. These next one, two, three, four, five books um, I got because from the books that I brought home from my grandma's house, I didn't know they were part of a series, and I just have to try the first book in the series before I can continue on. And I think most of those, you can probably read them in any order. But I don't like to take that risk until I know for sure. So I bought the first book in these series, and that's these next five books. So this first one is called Mistletoe Murder. It's part of a Lucy Stone mystery by Leslie Meyer. The synopsis says, As if baking Christmas cookies, knitting a jumper for her husband's gift, and making her daughter's angel costume for the church pageant weren't enough things for Lucy Stone's busy Christmas schedule, She's also working the night shift at a mail order company. 
but when she discovers its wealthy founder, Sam Miller, dead in his car from an apparent suicide, the sleuth in her knows something just doesn't smell right. Lucy is convinced that someone murdered Sam, but who and why? With each twist she uncovers in this bizarre case, another shocking revelation is exposed. Now, as Christmas draws near and Lucy gets dangerously, dangerously close to the truth, she's about to receive a present from Santa she didn't ask for. A killer who won't be satisfied until everyone on his shopping list is dead, including Lucy herself. Yeah. Okay, the next one is called Meet Me at the Cupcake Cafe. This was by Jenny Colgan. This one says, Issy Randall can bake. No, Issy can create stunning, mouth-wateringly divine cakes. After a childhood spent in her beloved Grandpa Joe's bakery, Issy has undoubtedly inherited his talent. She's much better at baking than she is at filing. So when she's laid off from her desk job and loses her boyfriend, Issy decides to open her own little cafe. But she soon learns that her piece of cake recipe for a fresh start might be a little more complicated than throwing some sugar and butter together. Uh, it says, a smart, quirky, contemporary confection of recipes and friendship. It's about how life might not always taste like you expect, but there's always room for dessert. So, yeah. So meet me at the Cupcake Cafe. All right, this next one is called Wolf Hollow by Lauren Wolk. And this one says, Despite growing up in the shadows cast by two world wars, Annabelle has lived a mostly quiet, steady life in her small Pennsylvania town until the day a new student, Barry Glengarry, walks into her class. Betty quickly reveals herself to be cruel and manipulative, and though her bullying seems isolated at first, it quickly escalates. Toby, a reclusive World War I veteran, soon becomes the target of Betty's attacks. While others see Toby's strangeness, Annabelle knows only kindness. And as tensions mount in their small community, Annabelle must find the courage to stand as a lone voice for justice. So this is, I do know, is a middle grade. And so I do like the fact that this one is going to be talking about standing, standing up against bullying. I think that would be a great topic for middle graders to read. And yeah, so that is Wolf Hollow by Lauren Wolk. <sighs> this next one, and I mentioned, mentioned this in my Durango book call. Uh, my grandma used to love the artist Thomas Kincaid until she found out he was a bit of a philanderer and slept around. So she was not happy about that. But she had a book that was part of a series where he co-authored, um, it sounds like. And so I went ahead and got the first one. And that is Cape Light by Thomas Kincaid and Kath Catherine Spencer. Um, so this, the cover that you're seeing is his artwork. Uh, that's, that's his style. Beautiful, beautiful artwork. All right, this one says, Nestled in New England is the picturesque seaside hamlet of Cape Light, where everyone knows everyone and folks still care about one another. But Cape Lighters have their share of hidden dreams, desires, and doubts, too. Like Mayor Emily War Warwick, who sometimes feel that her feels that her job and her identity are inseparable, and her sister and rival Jessica, who has torn herself away from the big city's excitement and sophistication to come home and care for their ailing mother, or Reverend Bend, who counsels and consoles an entire town while coming to grips with his own private sorrows, and Charlie, the owner of the local diner, who isn't shy about letting the mayor know that he is after her job. So... That is Cape Light by Thomas Kincaid and Catherine Spencer. The tagline says, It's a little town you've never been to, but you know it by heart. So, and I like stories that take place in a small town. I like that vibe. And the last book, not in this particular haul, but the last book of to start the series that my grandma had. Uh, this one is Do You Want to Know a Secret by Mary Jane Clark. Uh, my grandma liked mysteries as long as they were clean, so I don't have to worry about any explicit sex or anything, because uh, I just can't see her reading any of that. Could be surprised, you never know. The back says, secrets can really kill your career. Beautiful New York TV anchor woman Eliza Blake has a past to hide. 
Her popular co-anchor has a scandal he died to keep secret. The next president's pretty wife wants desperately to avoid an indecent exposure. A parish priest knows a terrible secret, and a killer has a secret agenda that reaches from New York City streets to the White House. It includes the time and place where Eliza Blake will have to die. So, yeah, sounds good. All right, these next two is there's a um, store. It's called Deseret Book, and it is owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They not only have church materials, so like scripture cases, copies of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, um, books with like stuff that, uh, like nonfiction books they do have, uh, like religious, that's the word I'm looking for. They do have religious books, but they also have a section that's just not religious. So they have plenty of fiction books in there. When you go in, it's not a guarantee it's going to be Christian fiction, but you're pretty much guaranteed, as far as I have seen, that any of the books you pick up are not going to be overly graphic or definitely not have sexually explicit scenes in it. So they're going to be cleaner romances and stuff like that. So not necessarily Christian fiction, although I'm sure there are s some Christian fiction in that, but definitely you don't have to worry about the sexually explicit stuff. So we kind of went in and perused, my mom and I went and perused, and I found two books that the cover drew me in. This first one is part of a series, and this is the Tales from Ivy Hill series. This is book number one. I really like this cover. Uh, and that's the cover right there. So it's The Innkeeper of Ivy Hill by Julie Clausen. I really like this cover. This one says, The lifeblood of the village of Ivy Hill is its coaching inn, the bell. When the innkeeper dies suddenly, his genteel wife, Jane Bell, becomes the reluctant landlady. Jane has no idea how to manage a business, but with the town's livelihood at stake and a large loan due, she must quickly find a way to save the inn. Despite her strained relationship, Jane turns to her resentful mother-in-law, Thora, for help. Formerly mistress of the bell, Thora is struggling to overcome her losses and find purpose for the future. As she works with Jane, two men from her past vie for her attention. But Thora has promised herself never to marry again. Will one of them convince her to embrace a second chance at love? As pressure mounts from the bank, Jane employs new methods and puzzles over the intentions of several men who seem to have a vested interest in the place, including a mysterious newcomer with secret plans of his own. With the help of friends, old and new, can Jane restore life to the inn and her empty heart as well? So again, this one is The Innkeeper of Ivy Hill by Julie Clausen. And one thing too about Desert Book, you do not need to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to go into the store. Now they have a section that you do have to be a member, but you kind of have to go down a little hall for that. Um, and that has like church clothes uh, that people wear for like the temples that you could see around that people wear. So that's the only area that you do have to be a member for, but just to walk in the doors and peruse the books, if you're wanting a scripture case, um, scripture markers, uh, study guides for the Bible or whatever you're looking for, you do not need to be a member of the church to uh, go in and look at that area and to look at, at books like this. So yeah, and they have nonfiction. There wasn't anything in the nonfiction area that I was really interested in. This last book I got um, is a historical fiction, which I really do enjoy historical fiction. This one takes place during World War II, and I loved the cover. And the thing that really pulled me to this one is that at the bottom of the cover, it says this is based on a true story. That's like, for me, one of the best historical fictions is when it's based on a true story. So, I mean, not necessarily based on true events, which World War II historical fiction you know, World War II is a genuine event, and so it's based on that. But I like it specifically when they are writing a fictionalized story of someone's life during that time. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm just interested in that. <laughs> so this one is Opera Sisters by Marianne Monson. This one says, and this sounds really good, it says... 
British sisters Ida and Louise Cook enjoy their quiet lives in South London. Ida writes romance novels and Louise works as a secretary. In the evenings, the sisters indulge in their shared love for opera, saving their money to attend performances throughout England and Europe, becoming well known by both performers and fellow opera lovers. When Hitler seizes power in 1933, he begins passing laws that restrict the lights and lives of German Jews. The sisters continue visiting the German opera houses, but soon Jewish members of the opera community covertly approach the sisters, worried that they will be stripped of their wealth and forced to leave their homes and the country. Ida and Louise vow to help, but how can two ordinary working class women with limited means make a difference? Together their beloved opera community, the sisters de Together with their beloved opera community, the sisters devise a plan to personally escort Jewish refugees from Germany uh, to England. The success of the plan hinges on Ida and Luisa's ability to smuggle contraband, jewelry, and furs beneath the watchful eyes of the SS soldiers guarding various checkpoints. But how many trips can they make before someone blows a whistle, or before the final curtain falls on Germany's borders? So. That historical fiction sounds really good. And so one of the reason I know, I mean, there there's going to be some Christian fiction at Deseret Book, but the other reason I know that they're not everything in their fiction book area is Christian fiction is because they've had books by Rick Riordan. So I have seen the Percy Jackson books. I've seen Harry Potter. Um, and I can't remember what else I saw, but other books that I have recognized that it's like that is definitely not a Christian fiction considered Christian fiction series, but they are, you don't have to worry about graphic scenes or sexually explicit scenes in any of those books. So if you, so Desert Book is a good place to go, or they also have a website. I'll go ahead and link the website in the description box um, so that you can look at the books that they carry if you don't live in Utah or in an area where there is a Desert Book. If you want books that you don't have to worry about that type of content in the books, Desert Book is a good place to peruse because of that. So you don't have to worry about that, at least in my experience with what I have picked up in Desert Book. So I've never had an issue like that. And I've there's several people I've talked to before that have the same experience. They've never had an issue with sexually explicit scenes or extremely graphic stuff. So if that's not your thing, you know, and you're nervous and having to do more research at like Barnes and Noble or other places, you don't need to look so much. I mean, you still can, but you it's a pretty safe base, safe bet, a desert book. So those are the books I got. Any future book calls in the future will be much smaller. <laughs> so uh, because January was a lot of grief shopping to try and lift my spirits a little bit with the passing of my grandma. Um, just giving myself something happy and something to look forward to. So any hauls in the future will be much smaller. Obviously December was also big, but that's because it was my birthday and Christmas. So <laughs> that was big. So it, it, it's, it's been two big months with book hauls, but they will be smaller in the future. So that's going to be it. I will do another book haul video for the month of January, but that one's going to be the ebooks that I got. Um, and all I'll say is that I didn't spend any money on these. <laughs> they were all the ones I'll talk about in that, and I'll mention it in that video, are ones that I won from Goodreads, and I got a good selection. So looking forward to those ones as well. So let me know if you've read any of these books what you're most excited to read, just talk to me in the comment section below. And until next time, stay true to yourself and enjoy a good book. And I'll talk to you later.